Hey everybody, welcome to Nerds of the Old Republic. I'm Adam. I'm Sean. And I'm Mike. And we are here giving our first taste test of my uh, inaugural, my first Bloody Mary ever made, so I'm nervous as fuck. But uh, let's see, how would you describe it? What does it look like? Well, first of all, now that I know I can swear, I'm going to say... Yeah, that this is an explicit podcast. It looks pretty fucking awesome, I'm going to be honest right. with you. I don't even know what to make of it. It's like, how do I drink it? <laughs> it looks like a fucking work of art. <laughs> now that we have established that we can swear. Yeah, right. there's an E next to the podcast name. More akin Fantastic. to sculpture than drink, I True. would say. Ooh. True. You are a poet, sir. So, so basically, there's a little lemon on the edge there, because that's my lazy garnish. And then I got some bacon and some pimento olives and a slice of celery, which no one will eat. It's just there to look green. Oh, hey, now. I might eat that. Oh, well, <laughs> good for you for being healthy. And then a chicken wing, which was made to Buffalo's hot specifications. So it, it should be hot. You use Frank's, of course. Yeah, only Frank's. We are not sponsored by Frank's Red Hot Sauce. Although, if you'd like to, Frank's, we are available to take sponsorships. You certainly could. <laughs> certainly could. You know, when we talked about the book being... World War Z, my first thought was, what is the most appropriate drink ever, even if I don't drink it? And it's a Bloody Mary, which I don't drink. Mm. But I just wanted as much meat and red thing in our hands as we talked about this book. Yeah. All right, are we, are we ready to give this a go here? Let's do it. All right, All right don't hate me, please. <laughs> first thoughts. There's a lot happening there. Yeah. First of all, my hat's off to you, sir. This Thank you. Fine Bloody Mary. Yes. Thank you. It definitely is on the spicier side, which is how I enjoy my Bloody Marys. I got worried when you said a lot happening, because I'm like, yeah, I literally threw my <laughs> kitchen sink in here, hoping that I could hide any mistake. Well, with the ex possible exception of, of the vegetable, uh, there's nothing that could have gone wrong here. This is just many good things mixed uh, right into the same glass. Awesome. This is, uh, awesome. This is my <laughs> first handmade Bloody Mary. Mm. Typically, I think I've just gotten mixes on resorts and things, which mm -hmm. I never really enjoyed, but... This has got a real savory kind of, uh, I don't know, it's its good. It's just a good flavor in it. Possibly dangerous. Well, the night is young, gentlemen. Why don't we, um, you know, imbibe a little bit, and then we'll talk about the book in a couple minutes. Sounds good. All right, now that we've sufficiently socially lubricated ourselves here, why don't we... Uh, Start talking about Max Brooks's 2006 World War Z. What did you guys think? For me, this book was more something that I respected than enjoyed. I get that. I think I know what you mean, but like, it's, what do you it mean? was in that way. It was not unlike a Bruce Springsteen album, you know, which is something I've tried my entire adult life to appreciate. <laughs> oh, you mean Bob Dylan? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Mike no, no. and I have a long-standing beef about Bob Yes, Bob. we do, and, and perhaps that's another <laughs> podcast, and, and perhaps a whole series of podcasts <laughs> in which I will educate you. Oh, sure, of sure. Course. Tell um, me about how the man <laughs> came around. Hey, that's good, man. Keep going. Do, do no, some more. Do right. some more. You were saying. So you appreciate. <laughs> I have I have tried my entire adult life as a, as a music aficionado to get into Bruce Springsteen. I respect the man. I respect his art. I just don't enjoy his music. I get it. And my thoughts... As I was reading this book, were similar to that. I, I thought it was masterfully done in terms of the research, first and foremost, mm. that must have gone into this. The sprawling, you know, I mean, this this spanned the entire world and many different cultures. And I also appreciated the stylistic use of the oral history. Mm. I thought that was, you know, a cool idea. Um, but it never at any point came together as, you know, a... a enjoyable narrative for me it was uh it was difficult to read at times if, if i'm being honest you know i think i felt the same way like intellectually i loved it and i'm like yeah Ru uh, china would totally try to fuck us over we would totally ignore them oh i mean we did it's called 2020 but we'll get to that <laughs> but exactly the same thing like the lack of a protagonist who had to overcome some sort of problem sorry for getting teacher on you but, like, that made it hard for me to love the book as much as I liked the book. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't expecting the series of vignettes sort of style. And, again, disorganized around no central mm -hmm. figure. And I kept waiting for him to come back to some of the people that I was intrigued with. And their stories, like the girl who was digging up frozen zombies in Canada oh, and all I the garbage. That. I'm like, that's a pretty cool person. When is he going to revisit that? He never did. But, um, you know, I... 
I had never read it. And when it came out, I was a young teacher, and I remember a lot of my students reading it and speaking highly of it, loving it. I'm like, eh, okay, so 13-year-old boys love this book. Well, why do I want to read it? And then when you brought it up as something to read, and I got into it, I, I started to understand a little bit more about why they liked it so much because of that almost like video game-esque feel that some of it has. Like there's just these little cutscenes almost that you're like unlocking every time you get to the next level. And it sort of tells you the cohesive war of the zombies there. Yeah, it's got whatever the first section is, then the Great Panic, right. then the Turning Point. Yeah. Right. I, I just, like like Mike, I, it was, I got to the end with this feeling of, all right, where's the story? And maybe that all would have worked better. at The oral history, like, I, I did respect that. I did like that. But if he had narrowed the focus, kept, like, you know, some central characters and revisited those characters... One of my biggest objections to the book was the end when we're supposed to be hearing from certain characters again. For the first time, after 350 pages, <laughs> we come back to some characters and it's supposed to be like post-war, yeah. you know, and that should have that should have been like a moving moment. And it wasn't because I didn't remember who the fuck these characters were. <laughs> yep. Yep. That was yeah. the big thing is I had trouble for me. The big thing is I had trouble remembering what was going on because it was China doctor, otaku, then South African, I mean, some things stood out to me. We've already kind of chatted about Red Ecker and um, the snow zombies, which yeah. I want to come back to. But it's, yeah, exactly that. What happened? Oh, yeah, zombies. Right, right, yeah. Oh, I just had a thought. Shit. While you're thinking of your thought. <laughs> there you go. Fill the dead air, man. <laughs> uh, I read an interview with Max Brooks, who, if we haven't pointed out yet, we should point out is uh, Mel Brooks' son, and that's pretty awesome. Yeah, fun uh, fact. You know, there's a there's a legend right there. Um, but I read an interview with Max Brooks, and I thought this was really interesting. He said that uh, he doesn't view himself as a horror writer. In fact, he doesn't really care for horror. He views himself as what he called an anti-horror writer. Hmm. And what he meant by that was he feels that horror fans are comfortable people who are trying to be scared, like, for their amusement. Hmm. Whereas what he's doing is that he is fucking terrified of the world that he lives in. And he is trying to write a story to cope with his fears of the world that he lives in. Hmm. Wow. I did find that interesting. I thought that was a pretty cool point. It, that, yeah. That's interesting. There wasn't any of the typical like jump scare build up. Mm -hmm. It was really uh, very uh, anesthetized or, or almost like, like antiseptic. It, there was just nothing that you would really assign to a zombie thriller to it. It was really more of like, uh, yeah, this shit happened. Yeah. And we're okay now. It reminded me of, uh, this is my thought from before, it reminded me a lot of The Postman. And if you have any fucking idea what I'm talking about. I do, and I I'll tell you why. Because Tom <laughs> Petty has a cameo in yes. that movie. Tom Petty has a great cameo, because he's a stoner that runs a freaking waterfall right. bridge thing. So Tom Petty plays Tom Petty. Pretty much, well. yeah. He actually does. He they even say, "I remember you from before the uh, before everything." He's like, "Yeah, man." You used to be famous. Yeah, he's like, "Yeah, um, sort of." Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, what's his name? The uh, Dance of the Wolves. Uh... Jack London? No, no. The, the, the actor Kevin Costner. That's right. Um, it's one of his many post-apocalyptic movies of that era. And instead of Waterworld, he made it where basically the Postal Service saves the world, <laughs> and um, it ends in very much the same way. Like he beats like. Penny Annie Warlord kind of thing, and it's just like, again, it's a series of little, like, vignettes of what's happening in the world, and the postman triumphs, and the next thing you know, it cuts, and it's like, everything's great now, they've got power again, and they're back in Washington, D.C., people are wearing clothes that weren't made 30 years ago, and it's, it's just, there's no explanation for how they got there, it just Quick sort of transition. is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kevin Costner, though. Yeah, I mean, besides that, and Waterworld. To go back to a point you were making, though, about there wasn't the typical zombie fare in the book. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the book uh, was a moment where there was typical zombie fare, and then he did something really interesting with it, I thought. I don't know if you guys remember, early in the book, there's a scene where there's all these people that are fleeing one zombie-riddled town. Is it South Africa? No, no. I think I think we're in the United States for this oh, okay. one. Okay. Now, he's, uh, they're, they're on a highway that's leading them to another zombie-infested town. Hmm. And they all fled at once, so they're all stuck in a traffic jam. And they're moving very slowly, if at all. And the army of zombies is slowly progressing up the line oh, of traffic. yeah, yeah. Smashing windows, eating people alive in their cars. And there's this horrifying image of, like, a horse trailer that's violently right, shaking back right. and forth. I remember that, yeah. 
Now, that seems to me like a typical zombie right. scene. More visceral. But yeah. then what Max Brook does after that is he turns it into this interesting analysis of human nature. Why would humans do that? Why would they flee knowing they weren't going to go anywhere on this road because it was already backed up? Even if they could, they were going to another town that was just like their town. They weren't going to be saved. And then he starts bringing up, and I should have looked this up. He brings up a study. I don't know if this was a legit study or if Max Brook, uh, Brooks made it up. But uh, apparently a scientist or a sociologist or somebody went to a city and picked a random building and lined up outside of a random door. I do remember, oh, you remember, I remember that? that. Yeah. And slowly but surely, people began lining up behind It was in them. Russia, I think. Was it? Yeah, yeah the study sounds, was from... A, feels right. Or a long. Well, and I thought that was a really interesting thing that the author did there because he took this typical zombie scene of people being massacred in cars right which is horrifying and then he turned it into this interesting examination of why people make decisions under duress the way that they do and i thought that was fascinating that's the real triumph i think of the book is just the study of human nature across different spectrum and what people would do and you your reaction my reaction when i read that was like get, get the fuck out of your car and run you idiots <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Why are you, but then I've you seen think, too many zombie films not to. And the right. zombies are slow. Max Brooks is yes. very clear on that point. But yeah. when you think about what people will do is there's that, like, dilemma in the moment. Like, do I stay in the car where I know I have my own, like, glass and, and uh, steel cage around me, or do I take my chances and run for it? And we always we see it time and again, as he keeps saying over and over again, people are lemmings, and they'll just do what feels normal to them. And like that means sitting in traffic and not going anywhere, or sitting in your car and waiting for some zombie to punch its fist through your window right. and eat you. It's that's the probably the real terror of the book is just the human nature of it all, the way everyone reacted, or like the people who. Um, I mean, you wanted to talk about the the cold north there. Yeah, they all try to escape to Canada, which is sort of the the you know again we can make some jokes about that all we want, but yeah. everyone flees north to where the the zombies apparently freeze, and totally trash the ecosystem mm -hmm. and basically just human nature is the worst part of this book. The zombies aren't really the bad or part. Or the virus, man. Well, it, it gets back to the whole the walking dead. Oh, yeah. we are the walking dead. Oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, but that's the idea. It's the, um, like, the people are really the worst problem in all of that. And that's what she's, like, she's talking about how they have to dig up all this trash. They have to try and reclaim this area because it's been completely ruined by all the fat Americans who went <laughs> north of the border. With their GameCubes. Yes. Sorry, that did date it. But I'm like, okay, yeah, I get a GameCube 2006. I had one, too. Was that really? I, I, I skipped that generation of console. Was the GameCube the thing in the early 2000s? It was the thing because you could uh, rip GameCube games. So you could borrow really? them from Blockbuster copy them on your CD burner, wow. and then play them for yourself. So the GameCube was an optical drive spinning disc thing? It all was. Oh, I'm thinking of the N64. That was the last that was the chunky cartridge. thing. Yeah. Which one had Goldeneye? <clears throat> N64. Okay. So maybe we could go back to the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wanted to talk about the uh, Frozen North stuff? Yeah, the Frozen... So, I know this is out of order, but the Frozen North stuff is interesting to me because even when we like declare victory in America, we declare victory in all the other places, China, of course, being the last place to declare victory, they're still killing zombies in the Frozen North. Yeah. And there are actual movies that are on the same like plane as that. So Dead Snow is one that comes to mind where there are frozen Nazi zombies, of course, they're always Nazis. Oh, the perfect bad guy. That come back, yeah, and, and restart the zombie apocalypse. Hmm. Um, so it just intrigues me that kind of thinking about, like, the human nature said, like, we are the we are the plague, we are the, the virus. We never really get rid of them in the book. Yeah. They're still there. We're still fighting them. And we're still fighting ourselves and all the aftermath that we made. Right. But uh, the fact that one slip-up restarts the plague. Yeah, they never explained Anything about the plague. It was, eh, we don't know where it came from. We don't know how to stop it. All we know is that we got to kill them all. That, and that's in the first section with that. Uh, was that in China where that happened? And the doctor goes to the village. Yes. Right. New to but Chong. he calls his friend, right? And then his friend is like the one who's like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And that's how he knew that everything was fucked up and yeah. shit it at the yeah. end. Which implies that there is backstory to the virus. But it's I, as far as I can recall, it's not given in the book. He leaves it very vague. I, yeah. I'm sure yeah. it's intentional, obviously, not to, to delve into the, the details of it, but it's 
again, it's one of those moments where you, you just wanted a little bit more closure. Like, did they ever wind up figuring out how to stop it? Will they, like, in Walking Dead, will they all just turn into zombies when they die? Is it only transmitted through... I think he implied that it's only transmitted through a bite. Right, or yeah. close contact with a zombie or a zombie's icker. Yeah, it's not 28 Days Later where, like, if you get it in your mouth, right. you're, you're done for. Right. I thought one of the most interesting parts, and I guess getting back to the... You know, I didn't think of it as terrifying at the moment, but now that I'm re-envisioning it, the kids swimming and diving for mm. things in those lost cities in China and mm. stuff reaching up Patient out of the water zero. to grab them, or the stuff that was going on in the ocean where basically they're just incorporate still at the bottom of the pressure ocean and are able to right. like hit yeah. a, a, the hull of a submarine. That's the one thing that I think he punted on that really left me angry was the physiology of it. And you wanted more specifics? Well, no, I wanted real <laughs> realistic. I wanted realistic zombies. Damn it! <laughs> you know, just the idea. First of all, zombies never make any sense. They're they're really cool cinematic villains because they look badass and yeah. they're this unstoppable you know horror. But the the mere concept of how they function, I want I want a fucking zombie book that explains to me. How a dead organism can still animate without oxygen rich blood, without all the things that we know life absolutely needs. He kind of hand waves and said, Oh, there's brown goo in them, and we don't really know how they kept moving or how they withstood thousands of pounds of pressure at the bottom of the ocean and didn't just turn into like, you know, gelatinous pancakes or whatever. It's like these kinds of like ignoring basic physics and science that that to me just pisses me off. And this point hits close to home for me because I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something that I loved about this book until I fucking hated about this. Book. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. And it was the research early on. I was so impressed with all of that. I was like, mm. this guy is covering the whole planet, all these different, you know, cultures. And he's working all this stuff. And that must've taken so much research early in the book. Uh, one of the people that get interviewed is a, a smuggler and I oh, forget yeah. what country yeah. it's in. Right. But it yeah, goes back to Tibet, the, the horse, um, the horse trailer that's rocking back and forth. It was the human smuggler. It might've been Lhasa. Mm, okay. It was early in the book. I think sure. it was in Tibet somewhere. Very in early. Yeah. And, and so he, you know, this, this, he's giving all these details about the smuggling culture in this country and not just what he does, but what there's different like types of smugglers mm -hmm. and everything. And he's just dropping all this information casually in like a three page section of the book. And every section is like that. So at first I was like, this, this is amazing. The, the research that must've gone into this was incredible. But by the end of the book, I'm reading three page chapters about different kinds of fucking diving suits, <laughs> which I don't give a fuck about. I yeah. want to go to the bottom of the ocean and I want to like kill zombies. Yeah. I don't need to know how the suit evolved over a period of years. <laughs> uh, you know, that was a transition for me as the book went on where I was just like, we, we get it. You used Google. You learned some things. <laughs> it was 2006, though. That was a lot of Googling. That was a lot. Yeah, that was right. probably more of like a Yahoo at that point, right? He was, or he was asking mm. Jeeves about that. <laughs> I oh, asked Jeeves. There we go. And I, I'll give him that. It was an impressive amount of research. Yeah, because it was obviously a lot of fucking research. Man. Oh, for yeah. Oh, for sure. But he definitely got into the weeds on some random things. The diving suit. I mean, I got viscerally angry reading that section of the book. <laughs> Did you want to take the book and just throw it across the room, Mike? I may have done so if it were not a library book, and I respect my local library, so I didn't right. do shout that. Out, <laughs> shout out to the library. Yes, please, patronize your libraries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing that I keep coming back to, like, the realism didn't bother me so much because as we were saying, like, in the, in the B-roll earlier, just watching so many zombie films, I don't expect to ever find out what causes it i think romero's and 28 days later some of the few that i can think of that give you a genesis to mm -hmm. the plague still not explaining right so like 28 days later it's rage or whatever it is some shit like that they're, they're testing something on oh, the animals yeah. and it gets out and they just call it like the rage or whatever fuck and then uh romero is nuclear radiation mm -hmm. so like you know zombie plagues are always the fear that the writer has based on their place and time and knowing now what Mike said about um, Max Brooks saying like, I'm just afraid of the whole fucking world. He did a great job covering that, Yeah, but it didn't drive me home. Like I didn't get to at the risk of being sexual here. I didn't get to the climax. <laughs> I didn't get to the resolution going, Oh, thank God. That's disgusting. Man. I'm sorry. This is a nerd I've, podcast, had, I've had two 
Bloody Marys, and this one has had three shots in it. So, <laughs> touche, my friend. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm enjoying the conversation, but it, it goes back to like it was very intellectual, and I thought that was great for reasons that it was different. And that's right. part of why I picked it. Besides the whole parallel to what we can talk about, transitioning over to talking about uh, the current situation we find ourselves in. But it didn't strike me as a book that I would keep, and maybe that's why I couldn't find my copy. Hmm. I read it in 2008. I think I got it as a birthday present in 2008 hmm. or 2007, soon after it came out. I don't know what happened to it. So you I usually must get to balance that it. table in the, uh, in the dining room there. <laughs> yeah, in the old house. It was yeah. holding up my CD collection there back <laughs> in the day when 2006 had CDs. Well, I think it's important, you know, to say that, you know, I mean, if... We're, we're criticizing it based on like, you know, our own views, obviously, because I, I think what we're criticizing it for, there are legions of fans that love this book passionately, True. and they would probably say this is the exact strength of the book. Please do not flame us. But, yes, please do not. That's right. And please listen to our, our next episode. No, Give us a it. chance. Fucking flame us. <laughs> gonna, if the world has taught me nothing now, it's like, just bring the hate, motherfucker. <laughs> That'll make us stronger. We're the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good point. That's right. We're gonna, we're gonna. This, this is that kind of podcast. Gonna, yeah, bring it. Yeah. yeah, Adam, you have to read all that shit. So that's, that's fine. Right. You, you guys can send that. I'll just on. mute all the shit that sounds dumb. But to your points, um, you know that it's it's all it's pros and cons. You know that the strength yeah. of the book is is the detached sort of like let's look at this as if it really happened sort of a thing and. But what you lose is, you know, as you're talking about, like, there's, there's opportunities missed. There's, a, there's another scene in the book early on where, you know, a wife is talking about how she, there's, there's a page or two of setup. And that's it. Backstory on the family. And then all of a sudden, there's zombies in their yard. And the husband uh, grabs a shotgun and says, get in the car and take the kids and drive. That's the one that drives north. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then as she's pulling out, the last thing she hears is, like, uh, you know, him firing the shotgun. And she knows... He's buying them time to escape. Now that should have been heartbreaking, right? Yeah, and that should have been a really tragic moment. But of course, as a reader, we have no connection to this right. family. We've had five pages of them. Exactly. And if you feel any heartbreak at all, it's only because you did the work. You paused to think right. about what that was right. actually going to be like. Um, that that pathos certainly does not come off the page. Right. Like even, I mean, who should we care about the most in this book? Right. Earlier in the B-roll, we talked about loving... Redeker and feeling badly for him. Shrug. There's a no. there's a dog I think that gets beat up in one of the later chapters. That's if I am I remember. Legend. No. Yeah, well, no, yeah, that was a, a dachshund. Why did the dogs always get no, it in these I zombie re- movies? I remember it was a dachshund dish. because my yeah. family had dachshunds when I was yeah. growing up. I'm like, he's talking about a doxy, and then he says it. I'm like, holy shit, that, a fucking zombie sniffing dachshund. That's kind of well, for me, that's the answer to that ass. question for me. That's the character that I feel the most emotion for. You know, in this you know, whole book. I want. Sure. I'm glad you mentioned that because there was something I wanted to get to. My the hero of the book, and I think just like the completely one-dimensional action hero was that General Raj Singh, I think his name was? Yes! That guy was a badass! Yeah, the guy who they had to knock out to get out of the area because he was going to stay and fight the zombie horde. And I, You know what? He's almost like that, like, he's like a tall tale character. He just sort of, he's sort of there. He's there when they blow up the that mountain pass. Mm-hmm. He's there when they're fighting in that place where they develop this sort of, like, phalanx, uh, uh, d- like, defense platform and then they helicopter him out. The guy's everywhere... Yeah. Where they need like that focal point hero, so you gotta wonder: is he real? Is he just like some sort of legendary figure that now it's like it's a, his name is ascribed to all these different events? He was really interesting for me, and I wanted more of that guy. A footnote to the mountain pass: mm. that chapter or section or whatever we want to call it ends with a monkey whipping out his penis and pissing uh, the guy's face. Well, that's just, that's, if we get an English teacher over here, that's just Max Brooks laughing at his audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's that some moment. James Joyce shit there. You want to pick up my footnotes? <laughs> Fuck you. That, chap- that chapter was hardcore shit. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. they were going to blow up the pass and kill all these people, and all, you know, all of that happened, and he gets separated from his buddy, and he presumably gets ripped apart. And, yeah. And then he's like, there's this monkey, and I looked in his eyes, and we had this understanding. And then he pulled his cock out and pissed on my face. How does, how <laughs> and does this section monkey, ends that way. How does a monkey yeah. pull his cock out, Mike? I'm just I'm curious. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, this, this is a paraphrase, maybe not an exact quote. <laughs> you know, we picked this book thinking that it was drearily like our current circumstances, minus the zombies. Boy. 
And did you feel that going through the books as you read it? I know Mike and I watched it, so that's a different situation on top of reading it. Yeah, you know, it's funny because the first few chapters, you're reading it and it's like, oh, China. Oh, some kind of disease. Oh, man. Uh, and my, my first thought was, really, Adam? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have For those of you listening, I have a history of picking books that Mike and Sean just go, oh, man. <laughs> no, no, but in a good way. Um, I just... <laughs> That's kind. A, a, a good kind of chagrin. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I felt like, like the parallels were eerie at times. And reading about it going like, Shit, did like Max Brooks like look into the uh, like the Orthanc stone and and see into the future there? And by the way, if you get that reference, you're in the right place. <laughs> and uh, just like saw that somehow some pandemic that originates in China is going to bring the world to its knees. It's just it obviously not nearly as dramatic, but it's yeah. uh, just that weird echo of reality. I think reading it now really kind of affects you while you're reading it. In the same interview uh, that, that I referenced before, I think it was the New York Times, um, but this was obviously pre-pandemic, but he's talking about, you know, as part of that whole anti-horror conversation, he references a lot of things. I think he mentioned maybe SARS, and uh, he mentioned mm -hmm. uh, global warming, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, possibly the war on terror, I don't remember, but he mentions all these, like, global catastrophes. Oh, those, um, as, those calm days of 2006. That's oh, correct. Yeah. But he, he mentions all of these types of things as, you know, obviously his, you know, exploration of the zombie war is really his way of exploring these types of global catastrophes. And so I guess it's probably not a coincidence that we have a, a, a once in a century global catastrophe happening. And, and we notice that it's, it's, uh, alarming. The, uh, thing that stood out to me was, and I don't remember what section it was, but there's a part, and I think this is near a quote, if not an exact quote, where uh, they describe the people as waiting for their leaders to tell them what to do. Ugh. And damn it, that felt familiar. Yeah. 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 We all just take a big, long drag of our drink at <laughs> yeah. this point. Yeah, if you could see, what we're all just kind of looking down at the floor right now. <laughs> yeah, the guy at the bar brooding over his whiskey. Yeah. <sighs> I am trying very hard to say I'm sorry for picking a book that was maybe a little too on the nose. Um, I mean, if nothing else, I think some of the differences, the parallels that did not carry over, we didn't see the nation as divided as we are now. So they were able to at least unify a little bit, or at least it seemed like the United States unified fairly fast you know, once it, they got it, their shit together. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. It was interesting how he still brought up like the factional or the regionalization of the United States in a lot of those different vignettes with like the Air Force, hmm. the downed Air Force girl who was like making her way through Alabama and some of yeah. the things she was encountering there, and some of the when they were doing the sweep across America and the, the pockets of. I don't know, like militia areas that they would discover. And it, it, it was interesting how prescient that was. And there's that fierce individualism, that fierce regionalism that is a big part of our, our, our nation and just the makeup of it. And it was just, again, I think that gets back to the real strength of the text is his ability to really analyze a lot of different human conditions. And he's doing that on a global scale. You know, I mean, that's definitely a strength of the book. He does that in the United States, but... I mean, there's just all these little subtle things in the mm -hmm. book uh, about different countries and different cultures. Like the Russian military it's, relationship. And it's yeah. easy to read yeah. those and just, you know, go right over it. But if, if you're actually thinking about the knowledge you would have to have to write those scenes, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know all that shit. So. Well, being Mel Brooks' son, I'm sure he's traveled a bit, too. I mean, you would have to assume, right? I would think so that Hollywood royalty gets around. Well, but. we also he's Anne Bancroft's son too, so I mean that is a double whammy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's some serious brains in that family. Yeah. Where are we at with the book? Would you give it a recommend or a no? Yes or no? Hmm. I would recommend it. Okay. Because, as I said, I respect. This was my Bruce Springsteen analogy. Mm -hmm. I respect it. Didn't necessarily enjoy it won't necessarily read it again, but it is a really, I think, unique piece of literature. The The oral history being done on that scale to tell a global story 
with potentially hundreds of characters here. Um, I mean, it's worth it for that experiment alone. And on that merit, it succeeds. Like, I mean, I think that Agreed. Max Brooks, were he here, would not like much of this conversation. <laughs> no. But I feel that he would argue that he wrote the book he intended to write. And I think he did a nice job from that standpoint. I think it's worth it for that reason. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say this is a book I would come back to numerous times, for sure, though. Fair. I, um, Sean? I also feel that as a piece of writing, it's a really fascinating thing to read. And I think if you're into that sort of um, pseudo-historical sort of... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like, I don't know, like speculative fiction. Or... Documentary? Yeah. Yeah. Documentary? Like a Ken Burns zombie kind of thing. Like, that's kind of what it is. It's it's uh, it's interesting in that regard. Honestly, I, I don't think I would have picked it up had I not been required to do so for the podcast. Well, thank you. But uh, it's, um, it's something I don't regret reading. I don't know if that's an endorsement or not. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like I wasted my time. I don't feel like I would sit there and say, like, God, don't read this piece of shit. But I also don't feel like I'm going to go out to people and say, hey, you got to read World War Z. That thing is fucking dope. Like, I just, I I, I don't feel that. And I don't want to say I'm meh, because I'm not meh. I hear a meh, though. No, I hear a fence sitter. But I'm not, because there were some genuinely interesting moments. Hmm. And, you know, I read it. I didn't, like, force myself to sit down and read it every night. I found myself going to the book saying, yeah, I want to read this. And, you know, Max Brooks, if you're reading this, I think he did it. Or if you're listening to this, you're not reading this. If you're listening to this, I think he did a great job with it. Agreed. It's, it's interesting. It's something different. And that, to me, is the ultimate success of this book. It's not the same old shit that we're, like, constantly, I'm not saying forced to read, but, like, that's just out there. It's something that is unique. It stands on its own right. Um and I think if you're just into that genre, if you're into like historical fiction kind of stuff, if you're into that documentary esque and you like zombies, sure, go ahead, pick this book up and read it. But um, I mean, aside from that, if you're really not into those things, then I'd say skip it. All right, all right. A lukewarm, tepid endorsement from Sean there. Yeah. Oh, I was going last because I don't know how I feel about this. And maybe that is me saying that I'm going to sit on the fence too. Um, the fact that I didn't keep the copy when I first got it probably tells me all I need to say. Same thing. It was really interesting. And I love how realistic it feels, especially now that we're living through a global pandemic that's killed over 400,000 Americans at this point in time. Uh, because a lot of the things that happened in the book played out in real life when we experienced, uh, a pandemic. Thank God, not of a zombie nature. I'm going to say read it, but don't buy it. Borrow it from a library. Sorry, library. Max. Sorry, Max Brooks. <laughs> Get it from the library. This is me making fun of Sean and then sitting on the fence and saying, uh. <laughs> all right. So there you have our recommendations. A resounding shrug. Yes. <laughs> I guess for World War Z. I'm sorry, Max Brooks. It was intellectually intriguing, but not genre bending or pushing in the way that we were hoping. But I got I, I'll add this addendum. Sure. I, I want to read Hedger more. Rats. I want to read more from him. And I, I don't know, I didn't do any research on this. I don't know if he's written anything else since. Not much. He wrote prior to this something called the Zombie Survival Guide. Yeah, I don't yes. Want, I don't want it's zombie, not a though. Novel. I want something from him that's just something else. Yeah. Because yeah. I think there's there's something in his style that I liked. Yeah. There's something there that was compelling. I just, I, I want something other than non scientific zombies. Is he, is he a victim of his own success here in pushing the genre in a way forward that was successful but not as intriguing maybe let me tell you the most entertaining thing max brooks has done and this is brilliant i think you'll all agree with me he gives speeches now and he makes a lot of money apparently giving these speeches great good for him envious wish i could do that too but the best part is how he ends his speeches at the end of his speech he invites a member of the audience up on stage to help him demonstrate the best way to fight a zombie, should one ever find themselves being attacked by a zombie. Love it. So the audience member assumes the mannerisms of a zombie, which he's very clear that they are slow, and they come at him, and he assumes a karate stance, (laughs) at which point he then turns and fucking runs right off stage. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, because we all know 
That's what I would do. That is entertaining yes. as hell. Absolutely. Nicely done, Max Brooks. That's, yes, you know, yes. honestly, he's missing an opportunity to kick some fans ass <laughs> on stage. Too. Who's the who's the biggest dick out in the audience? Yeah, who's the heckler? Punch that guy right in the face and then <laughs> Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. So hopefully you enjoyed this conversation from us nerds of the old republic. I'm Adam. I'm Mike. And I'm Sean. And uh, before we go, I just want to remind you that you can find us on all the socials at Nerds of Old Republic. Uh, that's Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. Uh, 